Well this is just going to be a quick update really I have been putting up a blog twice a week while doing this project and it's been okay um, I've had quite a lot to show and quite a lot to say but I'm starting to flag a bit now I mean I've got plenty still to say and I can put up plenty more blogs but there's nothing really new you know most of what I'm saying is is just repetition you know I, there's, there's a limit to how many panels you can usefully watch me wire up <laughs> for example I mean no one was done with the panels but one to go and uh, you know everything else is just starting to be de details really but really you know I've shown everything I'm going to put it all together at the end I'm going to try and make some kind of estimate of uh, how much I've spent. <laughs> Not kind of slightly worried about that because I think it's going to be quite a lot. What's still to do? Well, obviously the backlighting. I mean, I'm not going to go on at that at any great length about that. But uh, I've still got some glitches. I've got the the latest panel which I showed last time. The centre console, the autopilot controls are working, got the flight data recorder working, that's a really nice feature of the Twin Otter Extended incidentally. Having problems with the rudder trim potentiometer, I, these Bodner boards, the ones with the analog inputs, the inputs are supposed to be completely independent but somehow they're not. I've got my three levers from the third throttle quadrant plugged in and actually they were causing me a problem as well. I, I've I think I've done something slightly wrong with that incidentally. I've, if you remember back to that, I've got um, coming from the potentiometers on the throttle quad, I've got through the three signal wires and I've got a common ground and a common 5 volt. I mean, that seems right to me and actually it does work, but for some reason when I plug those into the Bodner board, there's something about that that isn't quite right. It's, so sometimes I've found if I can get two of them working and not three. But anyway, regardless of that, when I plug in the rudder trim potentiometer, that kind of works, but it but it interfere it's interfered with by one of the potentiometers on the throttle quad. I don't know why that is. No amount of tinkering has fixed that, so I don't know quite what I'm going to do with that. Maybe the rudder trim can be done with rotary encoder. If so, and I, and I do have a spare one, I might just take that potentiometer off there and put the encoder on because honestly it's not it's not that big a deal. I'm going to do some lighting. Uh, I mean the, obviously the backlighting, panel backlighting is important, but some cabin lighting in the meantime and also just in, in general. I mean I did think about putting just a dome light on here I could do that, you know, there's nothing wrong. I need to find a suitably small one. The other thing is these little... Where are they? The little LED spots, which I was gonna, or maybe still will be using for the backlighting. I might use these. I've established that, um, you know, if I have one about here, pointing inwards it, it gives me a nice illumination of these panels. It's not, ni it's not nice illumination, it's, it illuminates them well enough to to be able to see see them. It doesn't interfere with anything else um, but it's not aesthetically pleasing lighting. And similarly if I have a one about here just pointing sort of at the quads but, but really down in this direction um, it gives me enough light to work on these panels. That's really all I need. I did think about doing some, elab well not elaborate, but slightly putting some sort of horizontal beam across. These mount nicely into an MDF panel. So making some sort of affair. I might do that. But when I was experimenting with that, you know, the other thing I thought was actually there's probably something I can pick up in Maplins or even Curries. You know, some of these like LED book your e-reader lights or something like that just because what would be pretty good something on a stalk on a flexible stalk even battery powered or so you get some USB powered ones I just need two of those and then I can just clamp them on or screw them on and with some sort of flexible 
neck on them. So that that's just a real practi practical thing. Uh, I like to have a fan on here, some sort of you know positionable fan. Keep me cool. You see, you see what I'm saying. I mean, it's a struggle just to think of something to talk about on the blog. <laughs> uh, so I'm not going to persist with this blog. I think, uh, or, or rather, I'm going to go at it slightly less frequently. And really, I, I'm going to start making videos about the Twin Otter itself. I'm going to once I start flying it, I'm going to do a lot of stuff that's about. Um, well, I suppose in a way, tutorial. But it's not intended. You know, I'm not I'm not setting myself up to to do tutorials per se, I, I just I just think it's just really interesting as an aircraft. So so yeah, something about the autopilot, the altitude alert and the flight director, because that's really interesting and uh, it's kind of handy in flying this aircraft. You know, one of the things I've noticed is when you start to fly it by hand, it's kind of tricky. And it's tricky because, I think mainly, well partly it's tricky because it's got turboprop engines. And that's, if you're used to piston engines, there are some differences. And I think in FSX in particular the differences are kind of a little bit more exaggerated than in real life. And particularly there's a bit of a lag in terms of response to the power levers. But um, that aside, because of the way the engines are mounted, they're mounted on the wings, they're quite separated from quite widely separated from the longitudinal axis of the of the the aircraft. And the consequence of that is that uh, you get significant pitching changes when you change the power settings. And it's and it's not what you might be used to if you're used to flying something like, well, a Cessna, a Mooney, or a Piper, you know, one of the single-engine Piper, or even the, the Piper Twins, where the, well, certainly on the singles, the longitudinal axis of the fuselage pretty much lines up with the with the axis of the propeller. And what you'd be used to in a such an aircraft is if you make an assertive increase in the power setting, the aircraft will want to climb, or it'll pitch up, and it, and it pitches up for aerodynamic reasons. In this aircraft, you get kind of an opposite effect because the pitch axis is above the longitudinal axis of the fuselage. When you make an assertive increase in the power setting, the nose wants to go down, which is kind of counterintuitive. Well, it is to me because of the, because of the way I've come to this. And the converse is true as well. If you chop the power, you might expect the nose to drop, but actually the opposite happens. The nose wants to rise. And that can catch you by surprise, again, if you're not used to this, particularly on final approach, where you, you typically would chop the power quite late. So, so why am I telling you all this? Well, you know, it's one of the reasons that it's good to get familiar with the autopilot controls and the altitude alerter. Because there's lots of ways of using those to to counteract those unexpected pitch changes, or or actually to get some help in managing those. So, for example, on the autopilot using the airspeed hold, you can set that to. I mean, for example, I don't know if this is done in real life because because they don't fly this sort of aircraft <laughs> uh, in real or any aircraft these days. But um, you know, I found that, for example, on the approach. It's good to use the airspeed hold to set a sensible approach speed. And then you can control the power without too much regard for keeping the airspeed within safe limits. So things like that, you know, uh, and, and actually the the altitude alerter too, it's got you know it's got a go around feature, it's got a, I want to look at those in detail because they're just interesting and uh, I think it'd be really good to do a a detailed look at the the Garmin GNS 530 again because it's a useful piece of equipment in general but it's but it integrates to some extent with the the navigation with the autopilot um, but definitely some videos from the from the cockpit once I'm flying 
And the other thing I should say is I'm about to buy, probably about to buy, a new camera. So hopefully one of the benefits of that is I'm going to be able to film the cockpit much more effectively. The problem, One of the problems with this camera is you can't manually control the exposure. It's certainly not in video recording mode, which is a pain in the backside really. That's why I couldn't get good shots of the the GPS so hopefully we'll rectify that and then I've kind of got it in my mind I might do some proper tutorial videos on just little bits of what I've been doing here you know I've had a really I've had a really good response by and large uh, to, to this project and one of the things I have I have two things in mind as specific tutorials one is to build a GPS panel similar to the one I've got here, a bit simpler just with the G G GPS on it uh, and to build that around the Garmin G500 which is which is the one everyone's got and you know to do that just in detail I mean I, I you know there's probably enough detail in what I've done already for people to to have a go at this because there's not a lot to it really but to do that in maybe exhaustive detail, you know, to get the, the bodner board, the acrylic sheets, the, the wooden frame, you know, everything about the screws and the process of making the holes, because some people, I mean, I would have, you know, I would have liked to, to, to see that b before doing my own experiments, so that's one possibility, uh, and so, so what, I, what I'll probably do there is buy all the bits, as I say, make a, a series, or a sing, I probably more than a single video, a series of videos on that, you know, using all the things I've learned about how not to do it and how to do it effectively in this project, build a panel and then probably like put it on eBay or something and sell it because well, I don't need it, I've, you know, I've got, I've got my own panel here. So that's, that's one. Another thing is building some kind of equivalent to this VR Insight board, you know, something with the um, the rotaries, the Leo Bodner rotaries, which are which are better controls than the ones we've got on the VR Insight, because they I don't know they're just chunkier. They they feel good. They've got the integrated push switch. Um, so to to build a panel and show how to do the programming to get the uh, shift functions on there, and maybe. You just just that really. So there you go. See you later.